Uh, who? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nishchit, and uh, uh, I was an early engineer at Atlin, and now I'm in the platform engineering team. Uh, I live in San Jose, California. I'm here with my uh, colleague, Satyavata Paul, uh, to present uh, some of the case studies that we've done with Argo workflows uh, at, uh, at a company. Uh, and we built uh, scalable and effective workflows, and we're going to talk about some of the capabilities that we unlocked with Argo workflows uh, in a company. And uh, yeah, let's go. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to step, uh, step back a bit and talk about Atlin and how it's relevant to why we use Argo workflows. Uh, Atlin, think of it as uh, a place, uh, uh, a collaborative workspace for data teams. Uh, just like GitHub is for engineering teams and uh, Figma is for design teams, Atlin is for data teams to collaborate. Uh, we provide a single pane for uh, data engineers or any personas uh, to uh, trust, govern, and collaborate on data assets. Uh, if we go next. Okay. Oops, sorry. Oh, it doesn't show up. Okay. Uh, I think they are facing some issues with the internet. Uh, Yeah, we'll connect. Uh, it's it's fine, I guess. If it's, uh, can we go back a bit? Can you try once? No. Go back. No, it's not. Okay. Try going back. Is it good? Oh yeah. Uh, so I was talking about Atlin. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are graded top across the uh, all the journals that you could see. Uh, we have top right corner in the Gartner, uh, the first store wave, and also uh, top right in the Gartner, Gartner reviews, and we are uh, powering data teams across the world. Uh, to, uh, just to quickly preface, how, how many of you uh, use Argo workflows for ETL workflows uh, in a company? Oh, that's a nice show of hands here. Thanks. Uh, and uh, how many of you all have used it for more than 10 million records? Uh, show of hands, uh, because we are talk talking about scale here. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have some folks from PipeKit also here, it's fun. Uh, at Atlin, we, we took a bold step a couple of years back uh, to use uh, Argo workflows for data processing. Uh, for all of us who know, Argo workflows was initially built for, uh, uh, highly, uh, for highly paralyzed, orchestrating highly paralyzed uh, Kubernetes jobs. Uh, but uh, we took a, took a bold step to use it as a data processing, uh, for, for data processing workflows and ETL workflows. Uh, and uh, yeah, if we, if we go next. Previously, we also presented uh, some of our internal tooling that we, uh, that we used at, uh, at a company, which is called Argo PM, to manage uh, Argo workflows, which is built on top of Kubernetes uh, APIs. Uh, we did, this, did that at Amsterdam last year and also at Chicago, uh, Argo PA, uh, ArgoCon Chicago uh, for using the Argo CD. If you go. Uh, yeah, so Argo workflows, we, use, we, we heavily leverage Argo workflows uh, for our marketplace. If you see, we have a bunch of connectors we have more than 50 connectors, all of which is built using Argo workflows heavily. Uh, and we, let's go next, yeah. Uh, what is the ETL workflow, right? Just for some of us, uh, ETL is just extract, transform, load. Extract, you connect to a source, extract some metadata, in our case. Transform means you process, uh, you do some transformations on top of it uh, in order to comply with the schema that you have in the load step. Uh, in load is basically where you load the transform metadata into a warehouse or a data catalog, right? This is how it, uh, just go back, yeah. This is how it uh, basically looks like in Argo. It's a DAG. Uh, you can see there's some steps for uh, extraction, there's some steps for transformation, there's some, and then we just heavily parallelize to load it in the data catalog or, uh, or a data warehouse, right? Uh, if you go next, yeah. While using Argo workflows, initially it was going really great, uh, but then we hit some challenges with scale. Our source volume was really, uh, really, clobbering up, it's basically, it went from a couple of thousand hundred K or final K to millions, 10 millions, and, and we recently saw a request for 100 million assets as well, which is bringing in 100 million assets from source, transforming it, and also loading it. That was a huge scale for us. So what we're gonna talk about today is two, two pillars. One is performance, and the other is system reliability. Performance, when I talk about it, how do we perform well when there's so much estate at source, right? How do we massively Improve it. How do you provide good runtimes for our customers and manage the SLAs as well, right? Uh, let's go next. So I'm going to cover performance pillar, and, and my colleague will cover uh, the reliability pillar. In performance, there are uh, when you run a workflow, there's always two categories or of runs, right? One is when you run it for the first time, 
uh, in especially, especially in the ETL workflows. Right? One is when you run it for the first time, and then when you, once you have the subsequent run. What does first run mean? It, this is the first, very first run of the workflow, and uh, there's no state, there's no context, nothing, there's no state stored, right? Subsequent is basically when you have some state stored, and you can leverage it to make the run times faster for the subsequent runs, right? Uh, okay, let's go back. Yeah, that's about first run. Uh, the transformation step. So we realized that there was a single pod that we were using, a single process which was doing all the transformation. Uh, if you see, this is an example of a, a, a SQL universe where we are extracting databases, schema, tables, and columns. And we just had a single transformation pod, which is essentially a single process to extract, uh, to transform all the data. And we realized this was taking about 95% of the time. There was one more insight here that it was, for, if we just did our benchmarking, we observed that for 100 million records, it was taking the transformation step itself was taking 22 hours, which is almost a day, right? And extraction was another beast of its own, right? So just to give a breakdown of SQL universe in our customer environment, it was about 95% of columns. If you say, if you have 100 set of, est 100 set of estates, 95 was columns, three was about tables, and the uh, rest of it was database and schemas, right? So if you see a pattern here, if you're using a single pod, it's a, it's a good idea to just uh, parallelize. The reason was transformation was reading from record files, transforming it, and writing to a writing to uh, another file, right, which is more of I.O. bound. We realized that if we could just cut it down to, uh, cut down the scaled assets, which is 95% of columns, we parallelize it, we chunk it and parallelize it, and rest of it is handled by default, which is an existing flow, we could do some, uh, some massive improvements here, right? So we did two things here, right? We chunked the column output records uh, and into reasonable size chunks, in our case, we chose 10 million. In your case, you could choose any reasonable number after experiments, right? We did that. And after that, we used, we leveraged Argo's looping capabilities. If you have heard about with items or with sequence, which allows you to loop over and spawn pods for processing, uh, for processing purposes, right? That's looping. And we also did one more thing, synchronization. The reason we use synchronization is because you can't have the loop take over and just spawn massive number of workloads, right? You could have, you, the, if you choose a wrong size chunk, that could go up to hundreds and more of like workloads that you open, right? It should consume a lot of resources. So your synchronization, we set it to 10. And uh, here's a snippet, I'm sure it might not be visible because it represents a highly sophisticated workload in a very simple, compressed way. Uh, but if you see, we are passing on a chunk size. And uh, what we do is, uh, we also uh, make sure we parallelize the uh, column extraction step. Uh, so that it extracts in chunks and keep, gives us multiple files rather than single file to a process later in the transformation. And then we do a with sequence. We know how many number of files are there, so we'll do, we'll do a se with sequence, and we parallelize the column transformation, basically. The impact, as you see, it, before it would take us about uh, one hour, 38 minutes to, for transforming 10 million records. It would take us 22 hours for like 100 million records. It, it, it just massively came down with this parallelization. It was very simple novel idea, but we implied it with data, data workflows uh, here, uh, data, uh, ETL workflows here. There's a small nuance to it. The file size that we choose and the, how we mount it also matters because you're gonna incur, incur S3, uh, like the object store costs, where you're loading it from. Also, the size of the file will uh, take up a lot of the cost and the time to transfer, data transfer, basically. So that's about, that's about first run, but there's another chance that we come, when you solve the first run, you have subsequent run, right? Ideally, how would you do it as, like, how would, uh, in the existing flow, how would it exist as basically, you would extract the whole estate again. Uh, you know that some of it exists already in your catalog, so you wanna compare, you wanna do some diff on it, and then just update the catalog or the warehouse with some new modified assets, right? That's how it would work by default. But we noticed that there was a huge issue there as well. The extraction would take about four hours, for four million assets in our case, and it would go, the processing would go up to like one and a half hours, which is still a lot for us for a subsequent run. We already taken much efforts to run the first run, right? So what we noticed was, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, we had to extract all the metadata, we had to do compare, uh, we had to calculate diff, and we also had to load the diff metadata into the catalog to take a lot of time, a lot of runtime, right? So we realized some of the sources actually support or allow us to extract the update meta using system catalogs. They have system catalogs and tables, 
which provide the updated, updated metadata or updated timestamp, where you could just use that time and use a marker and just extract the update metadata. You don't have to extract all of those things. So that's what we started doing here. We just, you, uh, in the first step, we just extract the, uh, the timestamp. If, if, if it doesn't exist, we just start from all over again. Extract it, do the same processing, load it. But at the final step, we just store the final timestamp, which is after it succeeded, basically. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what we call as marker-based incremental extraction. What we do is just fetch the timestamp, uh, change the DDL uh, to use the modified, for, to, to use the existing timestamp, process it. Oops, sorry, what happened? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Have back. We have a lot of technical challenges today, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but this is a simplified version of the uh, uh, the workflow that we built. It's basically uh, extraction. We just have the timestamp to extract it, and we update the DDL that we send it to the source so that we just get the update metadata, and also we use the uh, y y just save the last timestamp so that we use the marker to for the further extraction. This is how we solved the subsequent run, and it came down massively again. Like this is again a simple idea that we implemented. And uh, the extraction time would just come down to 15 minutes, and the processing would be 10 minutes. We also had to not store any metadata again uh, in our state to compare it or calculate diff or anything. Uh, also, it reduced the uh, source being the single point of uh, truth for us. Uh, we didn't have to maintain any state, as we, as we said. Uh, the limitations, only few sources support this uh, type of extraction, because not all of the sources have system catalogs that have the update metadata timestamp. That is one. The second is uh, the sync, which uh, updates the system catalogs in the source, is also delayed. Snowflake has it three hours. Databricks has it like a couple of hours, uh, which might be a limitation here in the approach. Uh, that's about the performance pillar of our, uh, of our talk. Uh, my colleague, Satavata, will talk about the reliability pillar, how we solve some of the resource constraints uh, that we are facing uh, with the runs. Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, myself, Satabrata. Uh, I'm an engineer in Atlan, and I belong to the Atlan Marketplace team, and some of the connectors uh, I've built here. So today, I'm going to cover the reliability pillar out here. So when we talk about system reliability, the thing which comes in the mind is that, OK, we should be able to run our workflows in such a way that you trigger them and forget about it, basically, because and also uh, it symbolizes a kind of a trust in the system that you do not incur failures, right? Based upon whatever the state of your source may be, it may scale up in volume of assets. It may even, you know, change its own state. But the failures should not occur in that sense. So, keeping in context, uh, we have these two sets where we dynamically kind of allocated resources, right? Uh, in the in the pods or mostly the Argo workflow pods, and also we effectively parallelized query processing. Uh, so when we talk about query processing, there comes you know how we you know want to uh, init, you know, process a query to you know gain some insights. I'll I'll cover each one of them in detail. So yeah, let's uh, jump right in. So for the dynamic resource allocation, the challenge earlier was that we kind of statically defined or predefined uh, kind of a, you know memory and PVC claims in that sense, right? So. Let's say if your estate volume has scaled, right? This particular challenge was faced. Okay, uh, my pod is unable to handle the load for, let's say, you know, extraction of metadata, or even it can go down to processes, transforms, and then the publish or the load part, right? So if you see about the challenges of tightrope management, which we had here overall, is you know static resource allocation, as I mentioned. Other thing which was a bit of a concern for us is the cost saving measure because we. You know, if we allocated more kind of resources, it basically costed us much more, right? And you use spot nodes for spinning up pods. The reason being for us to save a kind of a cost out here, and uh, the way we kind of solved it is we kind of pre-estimated the amount of resources based on source volume statistics. What do we mean by that is that we uh, kind of send a query to, to the source. We kind of justify, okay, what are the counts possible, and then we kind of allocate the X and Y, if you see in the diagram there, uh, the memory and PVC claims accordingly, right? So yeah, we query the source to an estimate count. We kind of optically, you know, optimal allocation based on some gra graph or line equation, which we have, and then we kind of dynamically allocate this during pod scheduling, right? And here's a sample. If you take a look uh, at the highlighted part, we kind of send a select query, which kind of gives us the count of estates, and then we 
internally the code uh, which is there kind of you know estimates it based on some equations and then if you see we kind of use that uh, down here in the resources requests and the storage part where we kind of okay this is the amount of pvc estimated can you allocate this at the time of runtime right uh, so that's one. Second, what we also observed is that, okay, there is something known as incremental retries, right? So you can even add a retry uh, in case of Argo workflows out here and how that would work here is that, okay, I know that there is some predefined allocation which you have mentioned earlier, right? And your pod fails, but instead of failing the entire ETL workflow, what we can do is that, okay, can we do a retry? And we kind of optimize or maybe you know, vertically increase the resources based on, you know, let's say in this case, it's 2x, right? So such that the, as I told, system reliability is something where you gain trust, right? So you should not want your entire ETL workflow pipeline to fail off and you're unable to catalog assets. So this kind of helped us there. So we defined a retry strategy for the pod and we, and based upon the, you know, retry count, which is defined at the time of retry strategy, we kind of incrementally allocated the resources. Right. If you see the samples here, you should be able to see the retry strategies we have defined with the limit is two. Uh, you can uh, you know, define the limit as you want to. And if you go down in the container section where we have the request memory and the limits of memory, we kind of use that retry count over there to kind of you know, scale the resources uh, on the retry which we have. So yeah, the impact, as I mentioned, this is a very good impact. We reduced pipeline failures mostly and increase system uh, resiliency in this overall aspect, right? We have one more thing to cover. That's effectively parallelized query processing. And I think this is going to be a bit interesting out here. Uh, so we kind of process query for insights, right? So here I would like to set up some context. We do some query history extraction, right? So think about you have a SQL source. There are lots of data engineers, scientists running your SQL queries, right? These queries are basically some of the sources, for example, Snowflake uh, stores this in a timestamped audit trail fashion, right? So it's, I think, like, I mean, I look at query history to be a timestamp based audit trail, right, of your SQL queries. And this can be a gold mine of behavioral patterns, right? For example, if you talk about user engagement in like patterns, okay, uh, which kind of your data teams is using my queries here, right? Performance analysis, okay. What is the most resource intensive query? Or uh, where can I optimize that, right? Usage intelligence, okay. Uh, maybe there are some queries, sorry. Oh, okay. Maybe there are some queries uh, which uh, is not being used, right? Maybe there are very less amount of usage. Can I use that for archival, right? I may not need it in my source. So all of these behavioral patterns kinds of comes out when you try to query process for insights. In our initial scale, we actually had the estate volume of assets to be one to four million, right? And the query history volume here was kind of 600K, right? Which means the number of queries at the source. And there's also a part known as windowed analysis. So, okay, if I want to understand my engagement patterns based on some window, okay, let's say the last 30 days, right, even that kind of played a role because the more number of days or the way you adjust the window may differ in the amount of query history or the queries which you are processing, right? And we chose Delta Lake and Spice Park at that point of time. Uh, there were lots of reasons for us. Uh, it was a kind of fit for us. Delta Lake was helpful in versioning. It helped us to maintain rollbacks, right? And also Spark was the only available writer at that point of time for Delta Lake, right? So uh, this, I'm talking about PySpark. It's an in-memory based implementation of Spark, right? So the challenges here where we faced is when it kind of went from the growing scale of estates, right? So it, when the estate went up to 10 million almost and the query history, which we observe from some of the customers which we have went about 12 million. So it's like 12 million query processing. How can you do it effectively? Spark deployment was a concern for us because it was only a master only Spark deployment, which means it's a single cluster Spark deployment. The reason for that is related to costs because each of our customers do have one cluster dedicated to each one of them. Right. So in that particular sense, if you are trying to spin up multi cluster Spark deployment, it would again cost us much more. So this kind of uh, played together. Sorry, man. I think okay. So these are the challenges which we faced in this scenario. 
And the way we leveraged here is something known as DuckDB. Um, may I know how, how many of you are familiar with DuckDB and kind of use it? OK. So we kind of chunked the parsing of the queries, right? That's where we chunked the, fir the first chunk, right? And each one of those parsing, when, when I mean by parsing is that, OK, let's get some JSON metadata out of it, right? Some kind of relevant metadata. Then we pass it on to DuckDB for processing, right, here. And Argo acted as an orchestrator in this sense, right? So DuckDB was the implementation for us to process the queries for insights. And, uh, you know, Argo kind of orchestrated us with the parallel execution, maintaining synchronization over here, right? And at the end, we basically aggregate. So think about if you have, you know, let's say, n number of days to calculate, it can all run parallelly, and then you would just need one pod for aggregation instead of one singular pod, which was there earlier, right? Which would which did all of this processing across 30 days, right? So that's where Argo workflows came in. As I mentioned, it was kind of fast compared to PySpark because there was you know initialization was pretty much okay. You use the Python SDK for DuckDB, and it kind of handled 3.3 GB packet files per pod, right? So DuckDB kind of made sure your JSON has been uh, implemented in a parquet fashion. The beautiful part about this is that you can run SQLs over parquet files, right? So it's if you have a SQL background, you can, let's say, okay, I can do a SQL query to calculate the rank, which essentially means, let's say, okay, let me get the top five users of a particular query, right? So that's where we leverage DuckDB. And as I mentioned, Argo came as an orchestrator. We use chunk based loops, right, to prevent, and we also prevented memory overload, as I mentioned, what was there with PySpark. Semaphore control synchronization and cluster overload. Uh, sorry. Folks. Ah, okay. So, yeah, the cluster overload, because think about if you're scheduling pods on of a cluster, right, so semaphores of Argo kind of helped us. Okay, we do not want to flood the cluster with number of multiple pods. Can we do it in a more synchronized manner such that you know all kinds of pods are scheduled properly? So the impact, it was pretty much impressive. If you see the experimental observability, that's the single node uh, EKS cluster, uh, which we used, and it was kind of 2.3 times faster than PySpark. From a production observability perspective, the pipeline success rate kind of increased from the failure from 78 to 96.5. We had one of our customers who, where we observed this 2 million assets runtime cut. The runtime with the processing that we did with DuckDB from 71 minutes, it's came down to 8.67 minutes. And the pipeline failures, right? So out of every, let's say, 150 daily runs of workflows across customers, it was only reduced to mostly about four uh, you know, failures per day. And so the, you can see the drip down of the count of you know the percentage that we you know dripped here so this is mostly how we establish trust about how we can handle uh, argo workflows and use very you know simple and uh, techniques of argo which is there right to increase the system resiliency and trust for us so yeah uh, so that's all for today i know we face some technical difficulties here but uh, happy to take any questions right now uh, if anybody would have, uh, or uh, happy to connect later in case there's anything. Yeah, thank you, Savarata and Nishit. Let's give it up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. I think we'll okay. have time so for one question. Can, if, yeah, just yeah. one thing. You can just uh, scan this feed, uh, QR if you want to give some feedback, or let's say you have any questions, you can just leave it out there. We'll be down here in the corner if you want to connect. We are good to connect here. So yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Was there any questions? Oh. Any questions? One question? Oh. All right, thanks. Thank okay, thank you.